Hey everybody, welcome to a Clickstuff patron exclusive Heroclix class. Uh, this class is recorded on August 11th, 2019, um, and we're leading up to uh, Worlds. Um, so, wanted to give out, this is part one, uh, this is technically July's class, I plan on having another class closer to Worlds recorded. Um, so this class is... Um, going to be about how to steal an object, uh, map selection, and zero ring nonsense. Um, how to avoid it and how to get around it. So um, I've got a little bit of an outline here on what I plan on talking about and um, you know just going to kind of, I don't know, maybe ramble a little bit even um, as I go through all the thoughts in my head of what we're going to be looking at going into uh, Worlds in Memphis. Um, so let's just jump in, um, you know, so and I'd like to, one, apologize in advance, you might hear my son Theo in the background, um, or a little bit of air turbulence because the air conditioner is cranked here where I'm at because it is hot and humid outside, so, um, and if you like what you see in this video, um, after it's made uh, public and you'd like to get these classes, um, right out of the gate uh, feel free to subscribe at patreon.com forward slash click stuff um, subscriber levels five dollars and above get early access to the training classes so let's just start off here um, I've got the uh, amok time map shown um, and there's a couple of different ways to do this but I want to talk about the principles of how to make this happen uh, with any random given team um, you know we have things that like um, we have things like collector and whatnot that can just steal objects now or you know you can run over and um, pick them up with a sidestepper things like that if you have a big transporter uh, involved um, but you know for a lot of teams you know they don't rely necessarily on either of those two tactics like collector or a hyper transporter um, and you can just have this as an option built into your team um, and that's going to be the uh, Jean Grey object steal um, so in this example I've just got you know two Sheriff Stranges and Unseen and a Mr. Oz uh, point here being is that you have something that can you have two perplexes uh, someone like Uni can do that as well right um, you know someone that can call out um, Jean Grey and that can sidestep um, you know, someone like um, good old Unseen here. Lockjaw can do this right if he just picks Sidestep. Um, or there's some other choices out there that can do that as well. You know, Kobit can do her free voop situation um, to accomplish this as well. So this one's pretty straightforward. Um, but I see a lot of folks that don't, don't fully utilize this, especially in matches like um, Vulture or... Um, you know, even the zero ring that we're going to talk about. If you can win map and slow down either of these tactics, um, you're going to be much further ahead um, at the cost of a three-point ID without having your whole team be reliant on a steal an object um, tactic. So this one's pretty straightforward. I'm just going to ignore the fact that Mr. Oz has his special two-square situation. Um, and for this case, you just need a standard TKer. Um, now, this won't work if you face an opposing Mr. Oz necessarily, uh, unless you have that sidestep. Um, but there's very rare, I mean, there's not going to be a majority of cases where you're facing the 40 point Oz. So, first action um, TK out and unseen. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, you're going to call out Gene to here. All right, second action, okay. You're gonna go ahead and perplex up her range um, once, actually. So you, just, you don't have to have two perplexers, just the one perplexer. Um, I wish I got there, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, sorry, just the one perplex. I was thinking two perplexers, just because I'm typically having uni. Do that. Um, so, Sheriff Strange will perplex up her range to a 9. 
So that allows her to swing the object all the way back. So your second action is going to be TK the or your third action, sorry, is going to be to TK the object back. I mean, this can be something where somebody can then sidestep, pick it up, like you know, hold on to it, or even put it in their square and equip it uh, with the equip any objects. Um, so then, simply after that, Jean Grey is going to free TK herself one, two, three to here, and then Unseen will sidestep himself back one, two. Um, this creates the five squares so that Jean Grey poofs. Now, for what it's worth, this does put your Unseen in a little bit of risk. Um, so you need to be able to think about either playing a heavy object or something else that can help him maintain his stealth so that he just doesn't get, um, you know, shot, you know, from 10, 11 squares away by a Cyclops. Um, which is totally doable so typically I'll just play a heavy object um, for him to sidestep back onto um, that's pretty effective generally um, but in this case you've stolen their object it's all the way over here you can then equip it if you like um, or go into a situation where um, you know you just hold on to it um, yourself and maybe throw it at him the next turn or something like that. So, um, you know, from there, then you can kind of begin your standard first turn, depending on whatever your team has. Um, so that's really a quick tip, about a five-minute tip there. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about what the zero ring situation is going to be. And I think that this, <coughs> I could be wrong, could be right. Um, I think this is going to be a pretty popular Kobic Trader trick as we go into Worlds. Um, I want to go ahead and um, bring over this Poison Ivy's Greenhouse. Let's flip that around. Um, so if you play a the good old Colbic Trader Unseen situation that uh, just won UK Nats as of this recording. Um, you know, second place uh, all over the US Nats. It's won nearly all of the um, WKOs, um, just Colbic by herself. Um, so your standard, your standard play is going to uh, be. <clears throat> Unseen gets the reality, the, the sorry, the zero ring or the barrier ring. Uh, he's going to equip that guy. Um, and they're going to abuse this Poison Ivy's greenhouse. Um, so then Unseen is going to be able to then second turn. Um, of course, you've got leaderships and you've got the rest of their team. you got, you got a whole other team to do this stuff with. Uh, you know, you get the Groots, the Floras, the Suited Henchmen. So Unseen can clearly see to there. Um, he'll go ahead and drop. I'm just going to use these as barrier markers. Um, and so it can do six squares every turn, and that's what's going to be. And since barrier is worded as even if lost, um, that makes it pretty dang abusable on this map. So there's your four. Trader is going to carry it up. And then Unseen can do the fourth one, the free one. You trade the thing to Kobik. Um, he trades it to there. Um, Kobik can do a free voop. You can sidestep carry Kobik. Um, so then, pretty much at this point, um, now while it does leave a few open squares, like namely this one, you are approaching from this angle, um, which means that you're going to have some situations where um, you can't approach here. Um, well enough because you're going to get harassed 
by these guys. So in a situation, there is a potential where they can just lock you out. Um, you know, they will harass your um, ID cards or using ID cards to harass your colossal retail back here. You know, Kobit can do her thing with her improved targeting. Um, and then at that point, they can just lock themselves into barrier here. Um, so kind of a, you know, barrier is always a great tactic. Um, you know, a lot of folks have talked about the zero ring um, with tri-sentinels and, you know, how great Joker's Wild Green Lantern was. Well, we got about a two-month reprieve um, from that um, with the, uh, you know, until the zero ring was legal. So, you know, this is going to be one of the more, I think, difficult tactics to deal with at, uh, at Worlds. Um, you know, there's a few different options um, that I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, depending on how they set it up, um, you know, you got to hope that they're perfect with their barrier every turn. Um, you know, there are things, you know, if you can get a shot off potentially, um, you know, you can run a Wolverine up. Um, you can do something like um, free TK, you know, Jean Grey can free TK herself up here. Um, then potentially punch Unseen or uh, punch Traitor enough to get him off of his power, which is most likely. Um, but you're going to be leaving yourself out if you like TK um, out six and then call out something and then, you know, they have to get up there, right? So that's one of the more annoying tactics with those um, with this team or with this combination is that you have to get Trader off of his trading power and you have to get um, through the barrier so Jean Grey being able to TK herself up here um, you know someone with a good hypersoniker like I know I'm going to go ahead and just throw out Uni again because uh, he's my boy uh, obviously um you know, Vulture wouldn't have a hard time getting up here because um, he does fly. Um, or even like the Fast Forces Hulk based teams. Um, but this goes back to, you know, those teams are kind of all in on a certain tactic. Um, so you have to be careful that those teams also have their other, other weaknesses uh, as well. But it's kind of one of those situations where it's the the more you know, the better off you'll be. And that's why we're here. Um, so what I feel is probably the easiest way to deal with some of this stuff is going to be, um, if you can win map, to do the object steal immediately on a muck time. Um, or potentially the other option... Um, and probably what I'll end up doing uh, on my world's team is going to be something like the Doom Buggy. Because um, it's a 2x2 two two base that's going to be able to fit into this square. And that'll totally knock them off from being able to hide up here in Barrier. Now, this team can... Um, potentially double barrier uh, to prevent against Cyclops um, but the situation where you have two you have knocked off the main ability on this team to go to there and do that is likely going to be enough um, you know like say you take this situation here there's only going to be one line of fire uh, this map's a little bit off. But there's only going to be just a couple of lines of fire uh, where you're going to have to be able to approach from one angle or the other. So they definitely have a nice control situation here if their pieces are lined up here. Now, this is not necessarily how they would do it on this map necessarily, but it's just something to think about that experienced barrier players are going to be able to practice on their maps and if they win map they're likely going to have a backup plan 
but at least you can take away with a doom buggy or something along those lines to be able to take away the ability for them to just run up here to a hidey hole um, now there's a lot of other maps but they still want to be able to engage you um, I don't know if um, he's got the he doesn't have the uh, King's Tomb up here but if they're constantly burying on King's Tomb you you most teams will be okay with that because they're gonna have a hard time getting to you and being able to do the move up and barrier trick um, that we talked about just a few minutes ago um, so I don't have a picture of King's Tomb necessarily uh, but if you pick up that map you'll be able to see um, what I'm talking about um, as far as moving up and barriering um, and how that's going to have to be part of their tactic I believe now they can you know get pretty good map reach on a lot of things but um, you just gotta be careful they have to be careful just as much as you do um, so always keep track of your points keep track of who's scoring what um, target identification you know what's going to be the easiest way to get some points and keep that tempo in your favor um, I talk about that a lot um, you know, score what you can, get the points, realize what you're capable of giving up on your team, and make sure that you don't give it up or minimize the risk uh, for giving it up on your team. So, uh, let's talk about map selection a little bit. Now, I mean, I play a lot of ton of ranged teams, heavy range. Um, whether that was playing double Nick Furies back in the day. Um, you know, the improved targeting elevated 2015 2016. Uh, Doctor Strange shooting, Doctor Strange Faust shooting from across the map. Uh, so, I definitely base a lot of my map selection on range and what's the best way to maximize my range. Because uh, typically, if I can have a team where I outrange them and the map is opened up, right? Maps are generally always the most powerful game elements for zero points, and especially combined with theme. Um, so, you know, a lot of my matches that you'll see, Uni uh, goes to this map and has just fantastic lines of fire. Um, I kind of wish this map was WizKids legal. That way there'd be nowhere to hide. Um, but in that situation, uh, a muck time's just fine. And why is a muck time so good for wide open? Um, you know, the lines of fire from hiding either here or here are much less than the roller derby um, where they can hide here and here. Um, you know, there's very stricter lines of fire to get further up the map here. Um, Therese, if they are hiding. Um, further back here on a muck time you have more time to approach depending on reach versus reach uh, kind of alpha versus alpha or that first strike reach versus that first strike reach um, so that's kind of almost my first thoughts when I talk about a map needing to be um, wide open right this is why I always pick a wide open map um, you know, I'm not really playing a uh, map bonus, but there's also things like, um, you know, Iceberg Lounge is wide open, um, but the center section is often uh, troublesome, right? Because it's got the blocking in there. Now that aforementioned uh, terrain can help out open up lines of fire on this map um, to get rid of some of that blocking. Um, but it's really that blocking and elevated. You don't want anybody, when you have a heavy range team, you don't want anywhere that they can hide. Um, and that includes, you know, elevation and all this kind of stuff. Like, I love the arcade uh, when it comes down to um, rock maps. And if the site, yeah, there we go. I mean, I love the arcade and I love Strange Day at the Park. Um, both of those are fantastic wide open maps. Um, with Strange Day at the Park just being crazy good. But, you know, as we focus on Worlds Prep, you know, we got to focus on maps that are uh, with kids legal. So let's just take a look at that and do a quick little overview of kind of map selection and prep. So Muck Time's always going to be kind of my number one map. 
uh, but take a heavy range team too. Um, now, from there, it gets a little bit harder, right? Because um, you've got to talk about what maps are good for certain situations. Um, so, you know, the King's Tomb map, right? What I've talked about that one quite a bit. And why is that map so good? Why is it so, um, uh, you know, obtrusive or obtrusive to teams? Whatever word you want to use. Um, and that comes into like things like you know if you face that uh, uncommon skull that can mind control you across the whole map with the spectral ring, you know to start sniping your colossals, uh, that's not gonna be good. I mean, you King's Tomb completely shuts him down. They have to start blowing up walls, which they can totally do, but it comes down to you know do they have the time? Can you navigate that map to get over to your to their side of the map and start? gain points so it's all about being able to gain points what's the best lines of fire um, can you take those shots um, you know can you survive the opponent's shots if you put them on the same map that you're going for aka wide open um, so closed up maps that's all going to come down to practice um, and I'll say that time and time again but you know I use uh, Clay's site here the hcmaps.net um, and I will print these maps off um, you know just a standard color printer no big deal um, you know you can also do it in uh, roll 20 obviously um, I've talked about the snipping tool that's built into windows before um, but you can totally print off these maps bust out your print and paper and just scribble out routes take it get out a ruler draw lines of fire back and forth back and forth um, get used to where you can go uh, if we look at um, the AI map Galador Promenade that's a that's good for the astronomers um, you know you've got three to three over here count out your squares one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven get you back over here so 20, you know, roll 21 to tw 9, uh, 11 squares of reach, right? If they get up here, if they get down here, take time, study these maps, go over what, um, what situations can help you out. Uh, what lines of fire do you need to be prepped for? Hey, if they go here, I need to be here. If they go here, I need to be over here. Uh, if they go to the edge, what does your edge lines of fire look like? You know, familiarize yourself with the rules on edges and rims of elevation and fire, line of fire. Um, you know, how does hindering help you? Blocking, giant sized characters, colossal characters, uh, body blocking yourself, uh, stealth. Um, you know, where are your opportunities to be for all of these things on each individual map? Now, this is, comes into play uh, when I talk about, you know, studying for a world's competition or a nationals competition for three maybe even four hundred hours um, you know a lot of that is just trying to look at every map and understanding if I get placed on it what's that's going to do to me um, so there's luckily there's a lot of good resources out there um, that help out with that so um, so let's talk about kind of that we talked about open map we talked about a closed up map let's talk about like an, a, a trick map so oftentimes these things can be if you lose map they're going to take your team to this map um, and uh, you can have a bad day if you're not prepped for it right if you haven't done that study um, so on kind of some of the streams Nate had played on uh, he was taking his astronomers and uh, using a terrain to block off here and then parking his astronomers there and there on Galador Promenade with a walking wood here and here um, to where if you didn't shoot out of adjacency you'd get locked down by a walking wood um, and you couldn't get a shot off on his astronomers and his astronomers could just go for 11 squares and go ham um, you know which is not which is not a cool thing um, but a lot of those times those teams fall apart whenever they either A, lose map, or B, face something um, where their their trick is dismantled, right? So we talked about the zero ring 
and maybe to play a 2x2 two two terrain. If you play a 2x2 two two terrain and put it there, you have way more lines of fire uh, if you lose map and get to place your terrain first. Um, so just something to keep in mind that for five points, you're dismantling an entire other team's strategy for the most part. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, that that's always going to be a good thing. You know, and a lot of these times, you know, so you got a trick map. That's something like that where they use a map to strategize or uh, whatever a certain um, effort. Um, a lot of times that's too. They pay for the Iceberg Lounge and have a big theme and they steal your light objects. Uh, how are you prepped to deal with their light objects stealing from the seals or penguins or whatever they are? Um, you know, personally that's one of the reasons I play Jubilee on my team. Um, she's got the dual target, she's got the energy explosion, um, you know, you can outwit the super senses on one of them. She goes out there, shoots them, blows it up, and then you still have the capability of getting your first turn equips done. Maybe it takes you two turns, but you can get some of your equips done turn one that you would not have been able to do otherwise had you not had a plan for one of these trick maps. Um, and oftentimes, if this type of team that has a you know eight nine theme loses map to a team with a four or five theme um, their whole trick falls apart you still get your equips they don't have their seals um, and their a lot of their strategy falls apart um, you know some things are a little based on um, you know mind control right the bifrost that's a big one um, I use that quite a bit with Starro to last year's Rock World Cup win um, taking the one unavoidable, you know, Kobic teams, uh, you know, Kobic has mind control, uh, Trader can get the, the mind gem and get mind control. Um, this map is always, is, I think will be played to the day it's retired, uh, with a mind control based team. Um, so just be aware of your team's movement. Um, you know, if you have flyers next to non-flyers and you get dual targeted mind controlled, you know. Uh, if they carry you half half minus one and then drop somebody into the Bifrost, um, what's that going to end up doing to your team? Can you survive that? Can you survive that twice in a turn? Can you survive that three times in a turn even? Um, if it's like Trader, Trader, Kobic, right? Mind Gym, Mind Gym. Um, you know, be prepped. Know what your team needs to do on these maps to protect itself. Take a quick assessment of what their team's going to do um, and how to protect yourself, um, whether that's barrier of your own or stealth or something along those lines, be, be prepped, um, for that. <clears throat> so we talked about closed up, we talked about wide open, and we talked about sort of this category of trick map. So even in a situation of a closed up map, something like, uh, King's Tomb, um, that's going to be my anti-trick map, right? To where they have a trick of using, um, they have a trick of using, um, the skull. I'm going to use a trick of the map to stop them. Now, using a map to try to negate a 40, per, 40 point piece, um, you know, that can be one thing or another. Um, so, just something to think about there. Is that worth it? I think so. I'll probably do that. Um, so map accessibility is another thing. You know, if you can't get to King's Tomb, you know, what are you going to play? You know, you're just going to have to go through all these maps, right? I mean, a lot of times whenever I talk about full-on meta, I, I do not want to... Full-on competition, you know, you don't want to be limited. Uh, you don't want to limit yourself if necessary. Um... You know, think about what you're able to do, what uh, you can afford. Uh, I know that, that comes into a lot of it, but um, you don't want to really limit yourself when it comes to full out competition. Um, you know, there are other maps that are close, right? The Underground Cavern is just as obtrusive, I think, as King's Tomb. Um, so. You know, Muck Time and Underground and Underground Caverns, I think, is going to be one of the biggest played maps. 
uh, in worlds just because it's so good also things like Stark Tower can be good they can't shoot you all the way across on that map um, if you position your Colossals correctly so other than that that's um that's what I have for today's video of uh, kind of part one map selection leading up to worlds uh, so thanks everybody for listening and uh, tune in uh, later this month for part two and uh, we'll see y'all in Memphis <laughs>